Welcome to our review of Mountains Out of Mole Hills, a programmed movement game with fantastic table presence. Mm -hmm. Before we get uh, going, a big shout out to the op for providing us with a review copy of this game. Thanks, op. So Mountains Out of Mole Hills was designed by Jim D. Camillo and Patrick Marino. Features artwork by Elena Munoz. Now, as Sean just mentioned, this one comes from the op and was just published this year. So, yes, sometimes we do talk about the new hotness here. Mountains Out of Mole Hills plays two to four players. The more, the better, with games taking about an hour each quicker with less players. The game has an MSRP of $39.99 US, which is a great point for the production quality involved. Now, in Mountains Out of Mole Hills, players take on the role of a mole who's trying to be king of the hill by controlling the most mole hills. This is done through the use of a card-driven program movement system on a two-tiered board, where every move forward causes a mound of dirt to be pushed upwards and placed on the second tier of the board. After each of six rounds, moles will score points for the hills they control, those having their clumps at the bottom. There's also a neat toppling system for when the hills get too tall to stand. One of the highlights of this game is its production quality and table presence. The two-tiered board system uses the game box in a way that really makes the game stick out. A great place to see this is through our Mountains of Mole Hills unboxing video on YouTube. Mm -hmm. Now, the board design here really does sound out and is sure to get people's attention. It's not just that, though. The acrylic mole standees are really nice, and the somewhat rubbery dirt mounds all add to this table presence. Other components include a set of movement cards, which are fairly small but easy to shuffle due to that size, some turn tokens, a rock token, and a scoring pad. Now, one nice touch is that everything came punched already, so you did have to assemble the standees. Now, be aware, with the standees, they do each have a film on one side that needs to be removed, and this isn't really evident when looking at them. Now, there's also a custom silk screen six-sided die for determining what happens when a mole hits a rock. There is also, of course, a rule book, which I found to be very clear, well-organized, and even offers background fluff for people who care exactly which species of mole they're playing. The game really does look and feel great. It's designed in a way that the height of the two boards actually makes it easy to say, see both layers at once, and mm -hmm. design elements like the X and Y axes make it easy to see what square is over what. The mole hill mounts stack well and come apart easily, though you do need a bit of dexterity to make sure you don't knock over any others while placing new mounts, especially later in the game when some of the stacks are five high. Now, I really have no complaints at all about the production quality here. Though I gotta say that film is hard to spot and not easy to get off, but you know what, it's a one-time thing you do when you first open the game. Now that we have a good idea of what you are getting with Mountains Out of Mole Hills, how about you give us an overview of play? Okay, so the first step in playing Mountains Out of Mole Hills is assembling this two-tiered board. Now, this is easy enough, and the game boards are two-sided, one side being used for a two-player game, and the other being used for three or four. Now, the big thing to watch for here is that you orientate the two boards facing the same way so the coordinate system lines up. Next, everyone picks a mole and is assigned a player token randomly. Starting with the first player, everyone places their mole on an edge square facing whatever way they want. Then they place one mound of dirt above where their mole is standing, and that's it for setup. Now a game of mountains over mole hills is then played over six rounds. Each round starts by randomly laying out five movement cards per player. Once they're out in player order, players will draft cards one at a time until they have four total. This will leave one card per player left at the end, which are then discarded. Now, one interesting thing we discovered after our first four player game is that when playing with the maximum player count, every single card in the game will be used. They won't all be drafted, but they will co all come up for draft. And I noted during the unboxing, wow, this is a big stack of cards. I wonder why? Well, that's exactly why. Now, once everyone has their four cards, they're then going to put them in order. You're going to make a stack showing what four actions you're going to take from top to bottom. Now, the order here is important because all players will take the action on their top card first, then the card under that, and then the card under that, all the way to the bottom card. Now, once a player has their moves planned out, they place their turn order token on top to indicate this. Once everyone's token has been placed, it's time to find out what happens. 
So everyone flips over to their top movement card and then their result and player order. Now these movement cards include a few different things. There are your basic move forward, either one, two or three spaces, turn left and move cards, turn right and move cards, turn either direction cards, U-turn cards, U-turn and move cards, rock cards and mole cards. Now, while most of these are pretty straightforward, it's worth noting that the turn and U-turn and move cards let you do these actions in either order. Mm -hmm. The rock card lets you place the rock token anywhere on the board or move it anywhere if it's already up. If a mole later moves onto the rock, they roll the rock die to see which way the disoriented mole ends up facing. The mole cards represent your mole peeking their head above ground. When this happens, they topple the hill above them. More about topples in a second. Now, every time a mole moves forward, they push up a bit of dirt up top, which is represented by the player taking one of those mound tokens on the board and putting it at the bottom of an existing hill, either putting it on the board or at the bottom. Remember, this mound does go to the bottom, which I noticed people playing tend to want to just stack them on top. No, no, you're pushing dirt up from the bottom. So talk about theme fitting mechanics. No, no mounds are played if your mole doesn't move. So this includes turning in place, doing a U-turn, placing a rock, or using that mole card to peek. Now, movement in this game is friendly. While you are competing with your moles, you are, you're, you're all good friends and are very polite. If there's a mole in the, way, in the way, when you go to move, you just patiently sit and wait, losing any further movement. Similarly, if you try, find yourself trying to move to a wall, instead you just go as far as you can, and well, we already talked about rocks earlier. If you hit one, you randomly change direction. Now, just because it's friendly doesn't mean you won't be trying your hardest to cut off your opponents, and I'm sure they'll be doing the same to you. Now, the one thing left to talk about is toppling. Each round has a different topple limit, which starts at two, but goes up to five. After you move, if any hills are taller than this limit, they topple them. You'll topple them one at a time in the order they were created. Now, to topple a hill, you take all the mounds off the top, leaving the bottom mound behind. You then pick a cardinal direction to topple in, and then add one mound to each hill in that direction for each block you pulled off, starting with the bottom block and moving up. Now, mounds that topple off the map are returned to their players. Now, note, a topple can also happen due to someone playing a mole card. In this case, the hill topples no matter what the height is. Mm -hmm. Also, a topple can create another topple, leading to a chain reaction where each topple is fully resolved before moving on to the next one. Now, once all players completed all four of their moves, the round ends. At this point, a new player order is determined. This is done by looking down at the top of the board and counting how many mounds are visible on top for the player. The player with the most mounds visible becomes first player moving downwards from there. Now, player order can be very important in this game due to the fact that the first player gets to draft first, which can be huge. But mm -hmm. there's also an advantage going later when moving in order to be the last person able to steal some hills right before scoring. Now, speaking of scoring, that's the next part. At this point, players get one point for every mound in every hill they control. You control a hill if your mound is at the bottom. Remember, each move pushes up. At the end of six rounds, the player with the most points wins. Draft cards, put cards in order, play out the round and build hills, score those hills and repeat six times. Pretty straightforward, but is it too simple? Let's move on to our final thoughts. So when the op was awesome enough to reach out to us and see if we we're interested in checking out mountains on a molehills, I wanted to say yes as soon as I saw it. The table presence here is really striking. And as someone who runs public play events, my first thought was this would be great for playing at a public place, a coffee shop or a legion, a Knights of Columbus, a library, anywhere there's going to be non-gamers around. As soon as you were unboxing this, I knew you'd love it for those public play events. Yeah. Games that are not only good, but catch the eye and bring people in are the perfect ones for public events and getting more players hooked on board games. Now, at the time, though, our pile of obligation was growing, and due to the pandemic, I'm not running any public play events right now. So I decided to dig deeper and not just go for it. Now, the big discovery for me and what sold me on trying this game was my first thing I discovered was that it's a programmed movement game. I love programmed movement games. Robo Rally is one of my favorite games of all time, and probably that'll never change. I love Lords of Zidit. 
My favorite part of Wonder Woman challenge of the Amazon is how you planned out your actions and so on. Soon as I learned this was a program movement game, that's what got me to say yes. It's always interesting what mechanics different people are drawn to. Now, the one thing I couldn't figure out doing that research, and even after reading the rules, is what kind of game is this? I figured Mountains on the Molehills would be one of two things. It was either going to be a highly strategic abstract strategy game up there with games like Azul or Yinch, or it would be a silly family game with lots of chaos and very little actual strategy and tactics required. Turns out it ended up being somewhere in between. Yeah, because what you have here is a game where you do need to pay attention, especially to the turn order and what other players are drafting. There's bits of predicting what your opponents are going to do, as well as even bluffing while trying to mislead your opponents. All things a good abstract strategy game will have. But then there's a pretty high randomness factor. All your plans can be ruined if the right cards don't come up, and the rock rules with its die system for changing directions adds some real chaos to the game. Even with two players, your moles are going to get in each other's way. And with the friendly movement rules, that can often lead to turns where you do nothing. Now, all of these factors can combine, so there are actual entire rounds where you do nothing, and that's going to turn off some players. As we discussed after your first game, the confluence of events that led to that first play being less than the best showing for the game. Agreed. Now, the secret I found to enjoying Mountains on a Mole Hills is to realize that these things happen and embrace it, to laugh about it. Realize this is a silly family game has aspects of take that and silly gameness and still though try to play as strategically as you can the strategy game elements here really are solid and i gotta say pulling off an end of round three move that steals three tall stacks from the point leader can be highly rewarding but you have to be willing to accept that your big three move steal can be thwarted by a mole moving in your way or a rock placed in your path and it's not, it's not really as much a take that as a take what comes. Yeah. Uh, the ability to correctly guess a maneuver into a position in a program movement game like this is actually staggeringly small, yet it happens by accident all the time. Mm -hmm. Now that said, even when you do embrace the chaos, having a round when you can do nothing isn't ideal in any game. Now, when it's another player that caused it, sure, that's fine, right? You can laugh about it like, oh, I totally got cut off. But when it's the fact the cards that came up just don't work for you at all, that it can be a bit frustrating. Now, part of this, I will admit, is learning the game. This is something I didn't have on my first play, and I saw much better by my fourth. And making sure you're in a position at the end of the round where you won't get stuck is actually important. So you want to be in a spot where no matter what comes up in the cards, you should be OK. But even for accounting that, we have had rounds where no straights come up or no turns come up at all. We even had a turn where there was only one movement card and the rest were moles and rocks. I'm sure the odds of that are extremely low, but it happened in a three player game. Now, this unfortunate occurrence is, of course, minimized with more players, meaning more cards to draft from. Yeah, definitely. This problem is much worse at lower player counts. Uh, we've never actually had a problem with four players. I've never had it where every player couldn't get at least a move or at least a turn. But it did come up with three players, and it came up fairly often with two. Now, you can just take this as part of the game. But I personally suggest adding some kind of house rule to avoid this. And no, me, Tabletop Bella, Mo, I am not one to mess with game rules. I like to play games by the raw. But in this game, I really do think it could help. Now, what this rule is would totally depend on your group. Ideas to talk about could be making sure there's at least one turn or... um one turn or one straight per player in the card reveal. So if you're playing four players, there has to be at least four turns and four straights or do it. And, and you can do that by doing a mulligan, right? Wiping and redrawing, or maybe you keep drawing cards from the deck until you get those up, but then you're going to go through the deck more than once. Or maybe you can take cards from the discard pile as long as it's not the first game of the, the, the first pull of the game. Another one that I think is a, a valid way to do it might be to allow players to use any card as a turn or any card as a move, or a move forward one, as long as they don't have another one, right? In that case, you'd have to probably make them reveal their hand to prove they don't have one. But then you get into, were they able to draft one? And I, I, I worry that rule could be abused, but it might work. 
Yeah, even though we're not generally house rule fans, I think a mulligan for no movement cards is a completely acceptable alteration and perhaps something that should have been included in the rules. Now, when you don't have any movement cards available, when you don't have this problem, when, sorry, when you don't have any movement card availability problems, when you don't have this problem, the game works great. It, it shines. This is actually a really great programmed movement. Um, turns out it's kind of an area majority game. Well, it really is. That has fantastic table presence. I love the acrylic standees. They, they work really well in the, the fact that one of the things you have to track is which way they're facing. And the standees are great for that. Um, they also look really cool. Uh, the, I, there's something about translucent acrylic standees that honestly looks better than cardboard. Uh, the material they use for the dirt mounds is great, and you won't understand this until you touch them. They're just not, they're not fragile. They're not hard plastic. You can tell they're not going to chip or break. They stack really well together, but don't stack too well. Um, now, I would say I, I kind of wish they were a little wider because they don't take up a full square, but then you got to get your fingers in. I don't know. I would like them to be a little more stable, but that's a minor issue. I mean, they are meant to topple, but not quite in such a literal way. Yes. Yeah, the actual topping, there's no dexterity of making things topple, though. I got to say, that would be a neat game in its own. Now, I found Mountains Out of Mole Hills did scratch that programming movement itch for me. Personally, I think I would have enjoyed it a bit more if it was a bit more strategic and less random. But my kids, on the other hand, love it exactly how it is. Now, my one, my older daughter, is all about planning ahead and long-term goals. He's excellent at making sure she stays first player and has developed this double back strategy that serves her really well. That is until her mean father comes around at the end of the last round and steals all her stacks and thanking her for all her hard work. That's only happened a couple times. Now, my younger daughter, on the other hand, loves the chaos. If there's a rock card, she's going to draft it and she's going to end up putting it in the most annoying place possible. You will purposely move and block another mole, even if it's not what seems like the best move at the time, and she loves toppling those hills. Now, our friends Tori and Kat both thought this was really cool and have asked to play it again. Deanna, on the other hand, who's the heavy gamer in our family, will play when asked, but the randomness just frustrated. Yeah, I can certainly see playing it now and then, but I suspect I'm a little bit more towards D-stance, especially as I don't have a deep love for program movement as a mechanic, unlike yourself. Now, one thing that has come up in some of our gameplays with other people is that the game feels like it might be a bit longer than they'd like. Now, for my youngest daughter, it's maybe one round too long due to her expansion span. By the last round, I've noticed she's not really paying nearly as much attention as more playing randomly. Um, now, my wife found the two middle rounds where the hill height doesn't change kind of felt like they were just put in there to make the game longer because you end up playing like two rounds with a height of three and two rounds with a height of four. Um, Personally, I will admit our first two games did feel a bit long, but once I was playing with people who knew the game and I was able to teach a little better, it seemed to flow much quicker and it felt to be about the perfect length. So it's possible that first game with the end of that felt too long was just because we are also trying to learn the game. Now, I'll admit of all those plays, I played every one. So for me, I have the most experience playing the game, but and every other game I played was with someone who didn't know. So that might be why it kind of drugged out. Uh, but I will say other people do see that it might just be a little bit too long. But again, too long and just the game feels like it went around too long. Like an hour is not too long for a game. They felt it should be, I, th I think because of the randomness and the chaos, you generally want that in shorter games. It's more acceptable in a shorter game. Whereas a longer game with the chaos can be a little thing. Again, I did not find this problem myself, but I'm played with other people and what they thought is just as valid. Fair enough. And we do know that getting people to play a game multiple times in the first place anymore is just getting harder and harder. True. True. Overall, Mountains Out of Mole Hills is an awesome looking, quick playing, family weight, programmed movement, area majority game with fantastic components and very clear rules. It has a fascinating balance between a strategic abstract strategy game and a chaotic silly kids game which actually I think overall makes it surprisingly appealing for a wider range of gamers. I think you're going to get more people interested in this than if it was just a heavy strategy game or just a silly kids game. Mountains on a Mole Hill is a game my kids will happily sit down together and play, and a game I can just as easily break out with my experienced game group. While it may not be for everyone, especially people who are into real strategy and tactical play who are rewarded for their play, I think this one's going to appeal to many game groups. It's important to note that I think while this game could easily, on a first glance, 
be discarded as something frivolous, like something mm. from the 80, 90s era Mattel Parker Brothers uh, where gimmicks like Shark Attack, Forbidden Bridge or Pimple Pete uh, were a big thing. It's not that. No. And that there is a real game here worthy of a hobby collection. Now, I think the big place this game is going to shine and stand out is a great game for local gaming events, public play, game stores, game cafes, anyone who runs public play events, playing in a public park. This is the kind of game that can gather a crowd with people coming up and going, oh, what's that? I am certain I can hook at least one stranger playing this with this game out on the table at one of the Windsor Gaming Resource events. Well, that's it for our Mountains Out of Mole Hills uh, uh, review. A game with great table presence that is much more than just a pretty gimmick to look at. Yeah. Now, what's a game in your collection that you think has a great table presence? Let us know about it in the comments. Now, before I go, I also want to invite you to check out my written review of Mountains Over. Um, over. That just, I, I get it right for the whole review until the very end. Mountains Over Mole Hills would be uh, uh, something different. Before I go, I just want to invite you to check out my written review of Mountains Out of Mole Hills, which will be posted over at tabletopbellhop.com and will feature lots of pictures of this great looking game. 